Please welcome on stage Robert Lemke. I really have to say, since we have that helicopter, everything is much more convenient. <laughs> 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 and it wasn't so hard to get rid of that car in the end. Right, um, yeah, so this is um, about Docker, and this is also about NEOS and Flow, and it's about development. Um, and, well, my background in terms of Docker is that at some point, like after a half century of doing Flow and NEOS, I was looking for a new topic I could dive in. And since Docker has a lot of water, so I could dive into that topic and play with something and learn something new. Um, but it was also kind of a rabbit hole <laughs> when you start with that. And then it's not limited to Docker, but also uh, then at some point you end up in how can you use that in production, you end up with Kubernetes and cloud hosting stuff. And well, that alone is, is a huge adventure and um, more than a full-time job you could have, but still, I think it's really exciting. And I was looking for a solution. <laughs> People are reading my slides, very nice. Um, I was uh, looking for a solution um, to develop locally on my machine on different kinds of projects. So we had the use case, uh, most people have the use case, that they are not working on one project for 10 years, but there are multiple projects and they sometimes also need to change between these projects in between. Um, and there are all kinds of challenges related to it. And I guess most of the things I'm going to talk about, you also tried at some point in the past. So the obvious question I need to ask you, who's already using Docker for development? <laughs> yeah, then you tell me <laughs> what I need to do. Um, and who's using Docker in production? <laughs> Yeah, so and then the question is why are you using Docker in development? But still, there are some, some good reasons for it. So I, I won't start with, yeah, here we chose Docker and uh, this is how it works, but let's first identify um, some reasons which might speak in favor of Docker in the end. So the goals for my development environment were that I don't want to have any compromise on tooling. So I want, usually I want to work on my notebook. Um, I want also want to be mobile with that. Um, I want to use my favorite tools, no matter what tools the, the other people in the team use. I want to use my IDE and some, some other related stuff. So that was important. And if you use uh, something like a development server, which some agencies do. Um, mostly uh, web agencies um, having Windows workstations. <laughs> um, then they were, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> yes. Um, then, I mean, you're working on some server, which is convenient because it scales nicely and it's maintained by someone, but it has a lot of drawbacks as well. Um, that is not for me, I have to say. So I also wanted it to be fast. Um, I mean, there was a point when I was uh, running like up to 10 virtual box machines on my, on my notebook. And um, because you need not only that project, but also some related service, and then you forgot to sw uh, shut down that other project you've been working on, and then a new customer or some other customer asks, uh, calls in, and you need to tackle that bug and, and so on. So you end up with a lot of virtual machines, and that was a big hassle. Um, so obviously, it needs to be fast because otherwise, I'll end up. Uh, doing other stuff while I wait for my machine and Twitter and things, you know. So it must be easy to set up and easy to switch. Um, I don't want to spend 
half an hour setting up a new project. I w also want to do experiments like um, set up a new NEOS just to figure out if that bug is really a bug in the NEOS core or if it's a problem in my project. And I want to set that up and get rid of it fast again. And I need to be able to switch between projects fast. Um, and that that is a harder part that, um, I mean, you probably experienced bugs which were in the class of works on my machine <laughs> but doesn't work in production. And these are mostly bad bugs because uh, in the end they happen on some Friday afternoon <laughs> when someone deployed and things like that. And they are totally avoidable. Um, you don't have to completely reproduce the production system on your development machine, but uh, at least focus on a few things like PHP version um, and and, uh, and database version also. If you use MariaDB or something, there is a difference also in uh, patch level releases, unfortunately. So that really makes sense. Uh, you can avoid a, a lot of trouble there. But also things like uh, using proper domain names uh, instead of localhost that can make a difference in your application depending on what you do and um, also when you work with other services like microservices then you want to have test some some real interaction between these um, microservices and not just have the theory of yeah and then now it would call that and <laughs> you know or test that in production um, which reminds me of, I don't mention the way I would say like half of WebHTC's uh, I know actually still work on. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't say half, like maybe it's a third or so. And they are actually still working on the production machines. You know, like maybe they have a copy in a different directory where they have that development version. Um, I mean, that fulfills perfectly this rule, yeah? You have the development software version exactly like in production because you're working in production, you're developing in production. Um, and sometimes we even uh, have like support questions uh, for projects where there's not even a copy of production. And honestly, developing a NEOS site in production uh, is <laughs> is very difficult, yeah, without having lots of error messages on the website. Okay, then you don't only have PHP and and MySQL or something like that, but also other services like Redis, Elasticsearch, um, or as I've shown this morning, uh, you need some fancy service. Uh, written in Python, which you don't really want to install. I mean, you n if you install that on your, on your Mac, you never get rid of it. You will find traces 10 years after of, of that software. Um, but still, you need to somehow use that during development. Um, and that is a bit of a challenge as well. So when you do a composer update and that writes the composer.log file, you need to be sure that you run that with the right PHP version and uh, the right extensions and so on, which matches what you have in production. Because um, there will be a difference if you're not aware of that. So if you use, for example, PHP 7.1 uh, on your computer and you use uh, PHP 7.2 in production, um, or vice, uh, um, vice versa, then you will have slightly different versions of PHP libraries um, running in, in certain cases, and that can run into trouble then. So, without Docker, um, what I did previously, I had uh, multiple versions of PHP and so on, and that actually is quite doable. You can run that on different um, ports and, and so on. It's It's not impossible. Uh, but it's it's a lot of maintenance, and if you work in a bigger team, then you need to coordinate that and come up with configuration management like Ansible or Chef or Puppet and so on. And if 
if you're considering that, don't even start with that today again. Like, you can do that for servers still, that, that you can have some justification for something like Ansible, but not for workstations, I would say. Um, and then what I also used there was a combination of DNS mask, which is a DNS server on your machine and some additional configuration so you don't need to set up virtual hosts all the time for new projects so you just have a directory structure where you put in new projects and then can access that automatically that's what i used um, previously so um, i already asked you so it seems like everyone is using docker but um do you use um who's using his own or her own self-made docker development environment somehow only very few okay and and so that means uh, the others are using some existing images i i guess awesome who's actually using some real tooling or tooling library f uh, for docker development nobody one yes i i could have guessed um so let's let's look at the uh, options. So you can actually, I mean, Docker means you need images. Images contain, for example, um, an operating system, a stripped down operating system with something like PHP or Nginx and what you need. And then you combine them have these different containers and you use uh, can use docker compose for that locally and then what you can do is mount your volume that is the directory with your actual code on your on your notebook for example into this container and then uh, you can access the web server and that is using that mounted volume clear so far i guess yes so first of all um that setup you need to create templates and scripts in order to automate that a bit otherwise you end up with um, oh yeah i i copy that docker compose file from that old project because i thought i think that is mostly what i need today and then you need to coordinate with your colleagues again um, so you end up with let's let, let's create a little framework and with some universal docker compose yaml um, what you can do there, uh, which is a nice thing uh, Docker Compose supports, is uh, using environment um, files. So that means in that directory of your project, you can add additional .env files, which set certain environment variables, which you then use in your Docker Compose YAML file. That makes it a bit more universal in having, instead of having hard-coded values in your Docker Compose file. So, and then you have multiple projects. So everyone wants a port 80 and then you need to coordinate or like, okay, I only can have one project at a time or which ports do I use for which Docker Compose setup? That is something you need to, to tackle. And then most importantly, I guess, uh, if you use uh, Mac, for example, Docker for Mac, you have slow file access. And who experienced that file access is slow? <laughs> okay, you're using a Mac um, <laughs> or Windows. And why is that so? Um, in the beginning, I thought that it's basically the fault of Flow or Neos because we have, um, we do so much with proxy files and so on and generate all these files and I thought that this is the problem. The problem is actually explained later. <laughs> <laughs> no, so it's slow. I, I'll explain, I think, isn't that? Yeah, there's a slide. Um, so anyway, you could um, work with uh, git inside the container. So uh, for example, you could use docker exec uh, to go into the container and then uh, write the code there, but that means your code will be in the container. That is fast, but also when you remove that container, all your code is lost. So you need to sync it back somehow. 
Um, the other option you have are these new options cached and delegated, um, specifically for Mac setups. That is an option you can set for Docker Compose volumes, uh, which say how important is it that at any given time the files in the container match exactly what you have on your host, on your notebook. Because um, Docker tries to make that always consistent and that is what takes so much time because it will ask forth and back all the time. So, um, uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I, I have a different diagram, but obviously not in this, um, <laughs> in this uh, slide deck. But what happens actually is read access is so expensive for mounted volumes in Docker Compose. Because um, actually, even on a Mac, for example, there is a virtual machine running. It's an optimized virtual machine, but it's, it's a virtual machine inside. There you have a Linux kernel with Docker. And when you access a file in that container, even if it's only read access, um, it will try to make sure and ask the host system if the file has changed. And that can take a lot of time. And imagine you have lots of temporary files like in, in NEOS or Flow, uh, then this is what takes so much time. Um, but obviously that's not only a problem for NEOS, but also like for Symfony projects and so on. Um, and it's uh, this consistency mode where you can influence on how, how fast that is. So you can set that to consistent, which is the default. Um, you can set it on cached, which means that um, you develop in your original file system on your Mac, for example, and the container is basically something like a slave. So it only listens to changes you put in, in there. And that makes it a bit faster. Um, and it can also be the other way around. That means uh, whatever you in the container is changed wins and it's synced back to um, to your host system. It, it's actually, it can be synced in both directions, but uh, that is kind of the guarantee. That is the fastest uh, option you can have. And what we do now, or what I do, is that I only mount certain directories, which don't change so often, and uh, are not so often used for read access. And these are synced, for example, for persistent data like uploads and so on. And then I use uh, rsync for the other directories like uh, packages and, and so on. And that is a combination which works quite nicely for me, but it needs some tooling so, so you don't need to think about it. Um, also, when, when you're running in these Docker, uh, that Docker setup for development, uh, you need to somehow log into the container in order to run flow commands, for example, right? Because it's not running on your machine, it's running inside the container. So in order to create a new user or s import a site, you need to run a flow command. And for that, you need to log in. If you just use Docker exec for that, then you end up being some user with some rights, but it's not really optimized depending on what image you use there, and then you can have can get trouble like write access problems or read access problems and so on with files. Yeah, and that is not directly related to container problems or so, but um, sometimes you also want to have data from your production website on your local machine so you can develop in an, in an environment which is realistic. You need some of the pictures or all the pictures, things like that. And that needs to be handled somehow. I'll skip that. So I'll, I'll show you um, a solution um, which I created for, for our purposes. And at some point uh, we decided to say, let's share that in a way that we say we are committed to this tool set 
So everyone in the NEAS community can use that and we uh, make sure that we update that. And of course it's, I mean, it's not a classical open source project and so on. Uh, we, we maintain the Docker images for you. Um, so there's not, not a planned community or something like that. But still, we are very committed to keep that up to date and you can just use that uh, for your project. And I want to show that to you. Right. I have no idea what time it is. Is there a timer here some? 15 minutes left. Thank you. Okay. 30 minutes left? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so um, can you see that? Fine, is that a font size you can live with? <laughs> Great. So what I did here is um, I uh, ran composer create project for ne NEOS uh, site and then uh, did composer install. So that is just a fresh NEOS demo site. And um, then in case of a Mac, uh, you can install this uh, beach command here with homebrew. And that is basically, currently it's a PHP application, a uh, command line tool. Um, and I'm currently porting that to uh, a Go uh, binary, so it's easier to install and so on. But that doesn't really matter. Like, I mean, you have a few commands there. And what I'll just do is, um, I'll initialize a new project. I knew that. I shouldn't have tried it. Yeah, okay. You can use force, I guess. Force is always good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what did it do now? Um, local beach dist. I can't type anymore. Da. So, first of all, it created a, a Docker Compose file. And what you can see here is that I'm using a lot of environment variables. <coughs> And the idea is that you don't have to change anything in this Docker Compose file because everything can be set from outside as environment variables. Um, so what it will do is uh, we have a common network here. So that means all of your instances um, locally can talk with each other if you like. So if you need to create microservices or something, it has a web server, it has a testing web server, which we currently don't need. That's supposed to be for functional testing or so. We have a PHP uh, container and Redis in this case. Okay, so I'll just uh, s start that. Ah, I should have said no pull because faster. <laughs> so it started this con these containers now and now you can look into follow what's happening in the logs while uh, everything is starting. Um, oh, I think it's already there. Uh, Neos demo. Let's see. Oh, there we have it. So, um, can you see that? Yeah. There is a little trick I did. Um, uh, we registered a domain called localbeach.net, uh, which is basically a wildcard DNS entry which shows to your local host. <laughs> so whatever you d use as a subdomain, it always ends up at uh, 127.0.0.1. Um, that is just to to save you from the hassle to have some kind of DNS magic or ETC host entry. So you can use that for any purpose. Um, and how did now uh, this domain end up exactly in this Docker container? So 
there is one container running uh, a central nginx reverse proxy on your machine um, which has virtual hosts of course and that has some some kind of service discovery so it's listening to docker events and whenever something changes like a container starts or stops um, it will take some action and what you can see in Here's a .n file, which overrides some environment variables. And he, uh, here you can see, okay, it's a different project, I just rec uh, realized. But here you can see, uh, you can set the virtual hosts for your project. And when a container with that environment variable is started, the reverse proxy is automatically reconfigured to point to your container. Um, in Docker, every running container has its IP address and port and so on, and so it discovers that automatically. That means uh, you can now, yeah, just just work with that. You can also um, log in with SSH. Uh, I thought, yeah. And it looks, oops, it looks like that. So you have, well, a directory called application and in there you can run flow and create a user and do all the things you need to do. And then in your project, uh, the data directory, for example, that is automatically mirrored in both ways. Um, so that means if you create a migration, doctrine migration in your container, it will be uh, ending up here and persistent data will be here. So yeah, there's, there's one neat little trick. I think it's neat. <laughs> um, I had that idea during a shower. And I told some some guys yesterday I should should be paid for having showers. I think <laughs> maybe I make that a business model. But um, as you can see, um, this is a different project. Sorry, flownative com dot local beach net. Is that actually working? Yeah. So this is also working on on local beach here. Um, and you see there's a directory data persistent resources, but it's empty, okay? But there are images. How, where do these images come from? And who's this guy, I think? Anyway, so look, <laughs> look at uh, the URL, which you cannot see here. Flownative.com, local beach, net, resources, persistent, some hash and so on. Uh, that file does not exist, to be honest. Uh, what I did was the nginx in your container will check if that file exists. And if it does not exist, it will do something. Here you see uh, beach persistent resources fallback base URI. So it will just use the image from your production website. And that means uh, that without downloading any of the assets, you have all the assets already. What you need is your database locally, but you don't need the assets. And as you know, in NEOS, um, the assets are maintained in the database. So there's kind of a registry, resources, assets, and so on. If I log into the site, everything works fine. You go to the media module, you see the assets, everything's fine. You can actually delete them. But what you really delete is only the database entry, not the production image, of course. You can also create new assets. They will just be available locally. So I think that's a very easy way to work with projects where you have lots of images and don't want to down download them to your development machine. All right, so if you want to do that in production, there are a couple of options as well. Um, it really depends and, and this will be short now, but you can of course use Docker Compose, which is completely fine for 
smaller um, things like if you only have one website running or, or a couple or so and you don't need much um, uh, availability like if the server crashes of course then uh, yeah, you're losing that the connection to that website you can also use something on top Kubernetes which is great and awesome project it's also much more of a rabbit hole than docker it's it's quite a learning curve but absolutely nice but don't take it on the easy side like it, you don't introduce kubernetes in your company within a year or something it <laughs> you can take uh, quite some time with it and um I'd at least like to mention, since we don't have a booth, <laughs> um, but we created a uh, cloud platform for Neos and Flow, which is using exactly the same Docker images like you've seen in, in Local Beach um, as a cloud hosted uh, version uh, for Neos projects. It's like from very small projects for your uh, lawyer next door or something up to uh, automatically scaling uh, bigger sites. So, I don't know, do we have questions? time for a question? No, half question? If there is yeah. one really important one because the coffee break is next. Oh, coffee, yeah. Anyway, if you have half a question, please ask it and you cannot reach me on Twitter. Try this fancy new Mastodon thing I mentioned there. Thank you. <laughs>